a surgical technique for minimally invasive mitral valve repair by a small right thoracotomy is straightforward and reproducible. After double lumen endotracheal intubation, the patient is positioned supine with the right arm slightly distracted. The chest will be entered via the fourth right intercostal space. The incision is placed in the inframammary crease lateral to the nipple. Through this incision, with the lung deflated, the chest is entered again in the fourth intercostal space, which generally corresponds to the level of the nipple. After entering the chest cavity, the skin is painted with benzoin so that the soft tissue retractor will maintain excellent visualization. With a medium soft tissue retractor in place, a specially designed small chest wall retractor is positioned. The first step in cardiac exposure is retraction of the diaphragm with a 2-0 suture. This is pulled caudally, exposing the pericardium. The phrenic nerve is identified in order to ensure that the pericardium is opened well anterior. The pericardial incision is made approximately three centimeters anterior to the phrenic nerve and extended up toward the aorta and then down to the inferior vena cava with a suction protecting the heart. The right atrium is immediately visible. Two or three pericardial stay sutures are placed, generally one at about the level of the inferior vena cava and one near the superior vena cava. These are pulled out through the chest wall using a crochet hook. With the pericardium distracted, the pulmonary veins are easily visualized by pushing the right atrium toward the patient's left. This ensures that we are in the correct inner space. With the heart exposed, femoral cannulation is the next step. A single venous cannula will be positioned with echo guidance such that it traverses the right atrium and extends to the superior vena cava. Femoral arterial cannulation is standard. The femoral artery and vein are exposed with a two to three centimeter incision. The femoral arterial cannula is placed through a purse string using guide wire technique. With this secured, attention is turned to venous cannulation. Again, with echo guidance, the venous cannula is advanced over a guide wire into the superior vena cava. Both anterograde and retrograde cardioplegia are used. The retrograde catheter is placed with echo guidance. Then, with the patient on full cardiopulmonary bypass, attention is turned to the anterograde cannula. The aorta is visualized, and the anterograde catheter is placed low beneath the fat stripe on the aorta. A purse string suture is positioned, and then a specially designed, long, flexible, anterograde catheter is placed. Again, this is quite low to give room for aortic cross clamping. Additional myocardial protection is achieved by systemic cooling to 30 degrees. The aorta is cross clamped using the Chitwood transthoracic clamp. As illustrated here, this is placed in the anterior to mid axillary line, generally in the third inner space. A small stab wound is created in the anterior axillary line in about the third inner space. The chest is entered using a tonsil clamp, taking care that the clamp enters the chest just above a rib in the appropriate inner space. The Chitwood clamp is then positioned through the same incision, again using a hand to guide its entry into the chest wall. Under conditions of low flow, the clamp is then introduced just cephalad to the cardioplegia catheter. No dissection of the aorta is necessary in order to place the clamp. Accurate placement is confirmed by visualizing the tips. The cross clamp crosses above the superior vena cava, but does not obstruct the view of the pulmonary veins, as illustrated here. So the cross clamp is in place and cardioplegia delivered with both antegrade and retrograde techniques, as illustrated in this artist's drawing. Mitral valve exposure is achieved by a standard lateral left atriotomy with the help of an atrial lift retractor. The atrial lift retractor has a rigid bar which is introduced in the fourth interspace medial to the nipple, 
care must be taken not to injure the internal mammary artery and vein when it is placed. The left atrium is opened anterior to the pulmonary veins, and this incision is extended behind the superior vena cava and then caudally behind the inferior vena cava. If exposure is challenging, the incision may be carried toward the mitral annulus at the caudal extent. A stab wound is created medial to the nipple in the fourth intercostal space. The crossbar of the atrial lift retractor is introduced and a, an appropriately sized blade is chosen, placed in the left atrium and screwed onto the crossbar. This is then distracted with a special retractor and the mitral valve is visualized. Attention then focuses on mitral valve examination and repair. Through this incision, exposure of the valve is excellent. The anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, and subvalvular apparatus are all visible. The site of pathology is clearly evident with elongated cords to the middle scalp of the posterior leaflet. Other posterior leaflet cords are normal. The anterior leaflet is also inspected and in this case is normal. After completion of the repair, careful left atrial closure and de-airing are essential. Long instruments and the chitwood knot pusher facilitate closure of the left atrium. A standard running suture is used to close the left atrium with a stitch begun at the bottom and a separate stitch begun at the top. Before tying the sutures together, the left atrium is de-aired by taking volume in the heart and inflating the lungs. A hot shot of cariplegia is then administered and the aortic cross clamp removed. The chest wall incision is closed in layers in standard fashion. A single chest tube is placed and the on cue pain system placed in the intercostal spaces above and below the six centimeter incision in the fourth intercostal space. <laughs>